kind of in the bridge between an old year and a new year. Two days removed from celebrating the birth of Christ and five days away from celebrating the beginning of a new year. And I get a little nostalgic at the end of the year because I look around and realize this is the last time that we will meet together as a body of believers in this setting this year. And so it's a milestone and it causes us to stop and to pause and to think about where we've been and where we're going. Thinking about that, I was reminded of a phrase out of one of the well-known Christmas songs that we use this time of year, the hopes and fears of all the years. Might reduce it down singularly to the hopes and fears of the year. So I want to do something and invite your participation for a few moments. I want you to shout out a word or a phrase along the lines of the things that we mentioned. I'll repeat what you say for the sake of the internet audience because there's a good chance they won't hear it otherwise. So, in terms of faithfulness, how has God been faithful to us and to you this past year? Shout out a word or a phrase. Providence. Health. Birth of the first grandchild. Truth. Mission trip. Promises. Blessings. Okay. Hope. Okay, I got a couple others. But pausing for a moment on that one, Psalm 110, verse 5. For the Lord is good, His loving kindness is everlasting, and His faithfulness to all generations. It means a lot to us as we think about that this morning. Secondly, the hopes and fears of all the years. What about fears for just a little bit? We'll pause and think about what concerns did we have this past year? A word or a phrase. Supreme Court ruling, indeed. Pardon me? ISIS or ISIL, whichever they get called. We call it ISIS, yes. Cancer. Death. That's a short list so far. Addiction. Hmm. Economy. Employment. Let's preface the fears with Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Thirdly, and very positively, our hopes. What do you hope for in the coming year? I was hoping somebody would say that. Second coming. Amen. A hearty amen to that one. Pardon me? Kingdom, because it'll take the second coming to usher in the kingdom, won't it? Amen. Health. And a verse also familiar to us, but it's uh, poignant as we think about this this morning, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Amen. Those things in mind, we're going to use Philippians 4 to consider the transition from this past year and things to be focused on as we move into a new year. In Philippians 4, verse 4, a verse many of you can recite. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I'll be redundant, Paul says, rejoice. 
I'll tell you once and I'll tell you twice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Some people might hear that and read that and react kind of cynically. Are you kidding? Rejoice? You don't know my circumstances. Rejoice? You have no idea what I'm going through. My marriage is falling apart. God just seems silent. Never listens to me. The kids are driving me nuts. I've got some serious health issues. I'm stuck in my circumstances and I don't think anything's going to change. People have mistreated me and I'm not going to rejoice till I get even. But if I had more money, well, then I'd rejoice. So it's easy to be cynical as we read that, as we hear that. Rejoice in the Lord always. And Paul says, let me punctuate it again. Let me say to you, rejoice. Paul can say that because rejoicing is a matter of choice, not a matter of circumstances. He did not say rejoice because you've got the circumstances that are conducive to rejoicing. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I'll say rejoice. The call to rejoice is a little bit like the saying that we banter around and maybe don't mean that much. Have a nice day. You know, how often do we say that? How often do we hear that without any real meaning to it? Have a nice day. A lot of times it just sort of fills up the space and in the kind of cynical nature that I have, I've often wanted to respond. I don't think I ever have, but I wanted to respond when somebody said, have a nice day and probably didn't really mean it. No, I got other plans, but that I know wouldn't be terribly Christ-like, so I wouldn't do it. But it reminds me of a note I thought I'd show you here, a mom writing it to her daughter. Dear Julianne, have a great day, Mom. It must have been a grade school age kid. I love what she wrote on it. I will not. <laughs> if I were a betting man, I would assume she probably didn't have a good day either because I think her mindset was, I'm not going to have a good day. So, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Rejoicing is a choice. Right? Again, it's not based upon circumstances. It is a mental disposition that I will have the attitude of rejoicing. Along the lines of a saying, you might have heard that life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you respond to what happens. And the older I get, the more I think that is true. It isn't about what happens to us. It's how we deal with what happens to us. And so standing kind of on the bridge between an old year and a new year, we can reflect back on the past year and we can qualify it by saying it either was a good year or it was a bad year. And that's a fairly subjective thing to do. Well, what made it a good year? What made it a bad year? And kind of the irony is that someone who had a very difficult and perhaps tragic set of circumstances during the year might say, well, it was a good year. Well, somebody who may have kind of been on easy street and had things pretty well going well for them might say, well, it wasn't a very good year. So again, it's kind of a subjective thing. Again, rejoicing is in the Lord, as Paul says, and not in circumstances. And the reality check is Paul's circumstances when he wrote these words. I go back to 2 Corinthians and notice what he said there because this is typical of the things that Paul often faced in life. He was rarely ever on easy street. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 8 and 9, notice what he says. We do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength. And this phrase really grabs me, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. When I read a phrase like that, that we despaired even of life, I'm thinking, here's somebody in desperate circumstances. This is the same one who says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say, rejoice. He says in verse 5, let your gentle spirit be known to all men, the Lord is near. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. Pause and think for a moment if we were to describe you, if people who know you well were, would describe you, would they use the word gentle? And I had to think about that for myself. I don't know if that'd be the word that you all would use for me. He's a gentle person. 
But Paul says, let people know you by your gentleness. A rejoicing person, I think if we connect the two verses, a rejoicing person is well able to be a gentle person. And so Paul, I think, has weaved those qualities together. And so if we are in the habit of choosing to rejoice, we probably also have a rather gentle disposition. And along with that, Paul brings in another key part of this whole thing, and that is he says that the Lord is near. And so we're able to rejoice, we're able to be a gentle person if we're aware of the fact that the Lord is near, coming from a Greek word parousia that means the appearing of the Lord. And so when Paul says it, he's not just talking about the fact that the Lord is near to you all the time. We practice the presence of Christ, but also the Lord's appearing, and so it also references His second coming. So we are rejoicing people known for our gentleness because we are aware of the ongoing presence of Christ and expect Him to come back at any moment. And all of that works together to be the kind of people that we need to be not only in 2015, but in 2016 and beyond. Verse 6. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to the Lord. Be anxious for nothing. Again, the cynic might read that and kind of scoff. Be anxious for nothing? There's plenty of things to be anxious about. And every one of us in this room can say we got concerns. We've got things that could create anxiety in our lives and may be creating anxiety in our lives. Again, might be health issues, might be financial issues, might be some big decision you know you've got to make this year. Family problems, marital issues, problems at school, or whatever the case might be, there's plenty we can identify with and say that can cause anxiety, and maybe that is causing anxiety. And so be anxious for nothing. Don't overly worry about circumstances. And of course, we can ask ourselves the question, will worry change anything anyway? Has worry ever changed anything in your life? It hasn't in mine, and I've spent a lot of time doing that. I look back and I think whatever I worried about this past year, it hasn't changed a thing. Worry accomplishes absolutely nothing. So Paul says the remedy for anxiety and worry is heartfelt, all-inclusive, thankful prayer. And so the habit of prayer. As the saying goes, why worry when you can pray? Although sometimes it's a lot easier to turn it around, why pray when you can worry? But we'd be better off doing it the other way. So instead of being anxious and concerned and worrying, instead we ought to be in the habit of praying. Someone has said the problem with worry is that it arises from a belief that God will not take care of us. And when you get right down to it, I think that's what it is. When I worry, I've got to the point of saying, God is not going to take care of me. God is not going to provide. And I had better take things into my own hands. That, I believe, is a form of arrogance, isn't it? And so, one more reason to dispel with worry and instead come humbly before God in prayer, thankful for what He has done in the past and really, truly seeking Him out for what He will do in the present and in the future. Prayer that overcomes worry leads to the truth of what Paul says in verse 7. And, if we are anxious for nothing, but in everything we're praying and so forth... And then, if we do that, the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We can't be anxious and claim that promise, can we? If I am anxious, I cannot claim the promise that the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, is going to guard my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. When I surrender anxiety for the habit of prayer, I'm then in a position whereby my heart will be guarded, where I'll be guarded in my heart and my mind, and I will have the peace of God. And so it's really very, very practical and very, very important. And so inner peace will come from a lifestyle of prayer that overcomes anxiety. And then verse 8, Paul is getting to the end of what he has to say. Finally, brethren, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell, meditate, think on these things. 
few things are more critical to our lifestyle than how we think. And so it's vitally important to guard our thoughts. Someone estimated that the average person has about 10,000 thoughts a day. I don't know who did the study. don't know how accurate it is, but it's an interesting thought that we all have about 10,000 thoughts a day. If you do the math, that comes up to 3.5 million thoughts a year. If you live to the age of 75, that's over 26 million thoughts. That's a lot of thoughts. So if we have that many thoughts running through our minds, we ought to be very, very careful how we process those thoughts because they have a huge impact on our lives. And you know the verse, uh, Proverbs 23, verse 7. As a man thinks within himself, within his heart, so he is. Our thoughts determine who we are. So we may have 10,000 random thoughts a day that will run through our mind. The thing that's critical for us is to be very careful in sorting those out. Which one will I mull over? Which one will I really incorporate into my life? That will become part of my lifestyle because whatever I think, that will determine ultimately what I am. Many of us are picky eaters. There are certain foods we would never dare think to put in our mouths, right? But I wonder if we are as discerning about our thoughts as we are about our diet. Being picky about mental food is far more important. And so Paul gives us this great list of eight thought qualifiers. Again, many of us are familiar with this list here in verse 8. But of those 10,000 or so thoughts a day, we need to very carefully guard the ones that are going to stick in our minds, and they must meet the criteria that Paul outlines here, the eight criteria in this verse. Because if we do not guard and filter the thoughts that come through according to the criteria of verse 8, then we're going to allow some very detrimental thoughts to settle into our minds and lead us into a lifestyle that we don't want to be in. I know this morning in Joe's Sunday School class talking about things that we love, things that we hate. What does God hate? And in Proverbs, there was a list of those things. Well, we don't want those things because we want to please God. So we want to be careful of the thoughts that settle into our minds that determine lifestyle. We want to make sure that they filter through, again, according to verse 8, because we want to please our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? Paul uses himself as an example of what he just set forth. Because verse 9, the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, he says, practice these things, and if you do so, the God of peace will be with you. Which takes us back to verse 7, the peace of God. And so Paul says, I'm talking to you about things that are important, things that might sound lofty, but there's the reality check of the fact that I have taught you those things, and if you look at my life, I have modeled those things. It's humbling to read something like that because we might say, if, if others looked at my life, would they see those qualities that ought to be emulated? Well, maybe they'll see some of them, but there's some other things maybe we don't want seen. Paul lifted up his own life as an example, and he said, I have consistently taught you those things, you've heard those things, and you've seen and heard, you've looked at my life, you've observed what I've been about, and it's about all these things that I have just talked to you about. And so again, I bring myself as exhibit A of the things that are important for you to consider. Go back to verse 4 again with everything that Paul has shared here in these verses. Rejoice in the Lord always. We didn't linger on that phrase long enough. Rejoice, yes, but rejoice in the Lord always. And to repeat it, your rejoicing is to be in the Lord. That phrase is so important, we don't want to neglect that because it's all about being in the Lord. Being grounded in Him, we have the ability to do all the other things that He talked about. We cannot rejoice, truly, unless we are grounded in the bedrock of the Lord Jesus Christ that He talks about here. We cannot have the gentle demeanor that He talks about unless we're firmly in the Lord. We cannot overcome anxiety unless we are really in the Lord. We cannot have a life of prayer unless we are in the Lord. We cannot have a spiritually minded thought process unless we're really in the Lord and we truly do not experience the peace of God unless we are in the Lord Jesus. And so it comes back to not rolling up our sleeves and trying harder. It comes back to knowing Him better. And so that becomes the resolve that I hope we each have at the close of a year and the beginning of a new year is, I want to know the Lord Jesus better 
than I have in the past. I think about the song that we sometimes sing, Jesus, draw me close. Jesus, draw me close. That's what I yearn for and want as I think about this new year. I want to draw close to him, and I want him to draw near to me. I want to practice the presence of Christ, as some call it. Because, again, it's the key to everything we read here, and it really is the key for whatever lies ahead in this coming year. Because standing on the threshold of the new year, I am sure that none of us know with certainty what's in store for us in this year ahead. I'd like to think it's going to be a, a good and prosperous year for all of us and that all sorts of good things will come our way. But there is the very real possibility that we will face greater adversity and challenge than we ever have in the past. We don't know. We don't know, as they say, the future stands before us with a hand behind its back. And we don't know if it's a bouquet or a brick bat. We don't know if it's something good or if it's something not so pleasant. But the key is not what happens to us. It's what happens in us. And that's the thing to set forth this day as we approach a new year. Resolve to know Christ better. And resolve to know his Father through him better. Walk with him. Talk with him often. Make conversation and prayer a lifestyle. Learn from him and hold on to him. And do not let go, no matter what comes in this year.